can you can you see the screen uh, it's coming it's coming just a minute uh, yeah yeah we can see it you can start sir tell me when to start yes some participants are there so maybe you can start a minute or so okay Okay. Okay. Start. You can start. Start, sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, our topic is uh, diffusion-weighted imaging and diffusion tensor imaging. And in the last two lectures, we uh, you know uh, examined how the uh, bold contrast, the blood oxygen level dependent contrast, can be exploited in different in a brain you know applications in brain. And uh, particularly when you want to map the brain functions by using task-based fMRI. And that was one application. Second application was to look at the, you know, testing state functional connectivity within the brain. And at a snapshot, you can find out what are the different networks where the functional connectivity is perturbed because of the disease process or because of stress or any other reason. So today uh, we are studying uh, the diffusion process, the another contrast parameter of MRI, which is diffusion. So you all know what diffusion means. So diffusion is like Brownian motion in the brain. So we'll see how we can encode diffusion uh, process in, in the imaging. So in today's talk, we'll have introduction to diffusion, uh, in, uh, diffusion processes, and then diffusion in biological tissues, and then basics of diffusion MRI, you know, diffusion weighted imaging, then diffusion tensor matrix, Diffusion tensor imaging and then diffusion tensor tractography. These will be the topics which we will cover today. Uh, so that you know, and and diffusion has very beautiful properties that you know you can uh, you know look at the uh, white beta fiber tracts and how they are oriented in the brain and whether there is any you know pathology or tumor how it disrupts the the, the connectivity in the brain due to you know uh, dislocation of these fiber tracts and how, you can also generate the tractography and see all the tracks within the brain. And they are like, you know, at least like pictures which what you can produce using diffusion imaging. So we all know diffusion imaging uh, is a technique provides quantitative information about diffusion of water molecules in the tissues and the integrity of white matter fiber tracks in the brain. It is unique method to assess the important disease processes such as stroke, brain infections, abscess, and tumors, etc. It has a very great application in these areas, which are otherwise sometimes difficult to diagnose. And then diffusion weighted imaging can be extended, and uh, and you can make it diffusion tensor imaging. It's an application of diffusion imaging where several set of diffusion weighted images are required with diffusion gradients applied in different directions. So it is extended view of diffusion. You are trying to measure diffusion in various directions, at least six directions if you do. Then you can have, you know, this you can, you know, you can create diffusion tensor image, but it is preferred to have, you know, as much as number of directions, diffusion directions to create beautiful, you know, depiction of the these white matter fiber tracts. And higher the number of directions, the more accurate will be your results. But you know, when you increase the number of directions, you also increase in imaging time. So you have to again think what is important for you, imaging time or the the type of information you are seeking from this process. So we all know that diffusion refers to random microscopic movement of water and other small molecules due to thermal agitation, and which we call, which is known as Brownian motion, and uh, we named in honor of Scottish botanist Robert Brown. And uh, diffusion is measured as diffusion coefficient d, which ref reflects the average displacement of water molecule during a certain period of time. It has a unit of area divided by time, millimeter square per second. The diffusion constant for pure water at body temperature is approximately 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 millimeter per millimeter square per second. But in biological tissues, this is much less, uh, you know, it's of, of the order of one third of diffusion of water, you know, in, in body at body temperatures. So you can expect, you know, diffusion values of around 1 into 10 to the power minus 3 millimeter Square per second, and you know the disease when the disease process sets in, you know diffusion uh, processes can you know decrease or increase in you know in in the in the tissues, and uh, 
uh, and you know most of the times you know diffusion times are often prolonged in many non acute and chronic uh, disorders and this is a method of you know uh, detecting something some changes happening in the tissue at a very early stage so uh, now the, you know we all know that diffusion can be isotropic or you know anisotropic and in an isotropic medium that means diffusion happens in all directions equally the diffusion process happens in all directions equally so we call it a isotropic diffusion it's like if you have a glass of water it will have isotropic diffusion it will you know the mole water molecules will move in all the directions equally or they do not have any preferential direction but when it comes to biological tissues there are certain you know you know tissues which have an isotropic diffusion that means the diffusion of water happens in a very preferential direction sometimes and uh, the diffusion coefficient changes with direction thus the size of magnitude of diffusion changes with direction we call this phenomenon diffusion anisotropy that means when the diffusion is anisotropic we call it anisotropy and we can measure this anisotropy using diffusion weighted imaging and in brain you know we are since we are most of our work is on brain the diffusion in brain if you look at the brain tissues the gray matter is isotropic diffusion while as the white matter fiber tracks is anisotropic so that is a beauty that's why you are able to generate these maps of white matter fiber tracks which are very important in in studying the disease process so uh, for most fluids and some homogeneous solid materials like gels diffusion is the same in every direction these sometimes are so we we discuss this and uh, in addition to the white matter fiber tracks skeletal muscle or muscle bundle you know muscles are also fiber bundles you know there also the diffusion is anisotropic and when you if you want to study the anisotropy of the of, of the tissues then diffusion cannot be described by a single number or one direction so you have to you know do it multiple directions which we call as a diffusion tensor the concept of diffusion anisotropy and the diffusion tensor underlie many advanced processing techniques so when you do this imaging then you need to have a lot of you know uh, imaging uh, processing techniques uh, where you can calculate these fractional anisotropy or the diffusivity on the diffusion coefficient and also you can generate these white white matter fiber tracks you know uh, as per your uh, uh, requirements so if you look at the brief history of diffusion in using nmr and uh, 1956 diffusion nmr was first time you know uh, sickers and tenner they uh, demonstrated the diffusion using nmr technique in in 1990 diffusion imaging was demonstrated by lee behan from france and then in 1990 diffusion of stroke was and they they showed the application of diffusion in detect early detection of stroke by mosley and then diffusion tensor model was created by basan and lee bahan uh, uh, together and in 1995 the clinical diffusion weighted images were in as a product they came in the clinical setup and in 1999 diffusion tensor and white matter fiber tracking you know people started working with these uh, techniques uh, uh you know as as a product as a, as a in a clinical setting so how do we encode diffusion information you all remember now we had a we used to have a spin echo sequence which gives you a t2 and t1 contrast so if you look at this here this is a spin echo sequence 90 degree pulse and then 100 degree pulse then you acquire the signal this is our typical uh, spin echo what we do we apply to more gradients in between you know the rest of the sequence is same we are applying slice reaction gradient phase encoding and frequency encoding in addition to those gradients you are introducing two more gradients which is you know one between 90 and 180 degree pulse and another one in between 180 degree and the acquisition of the signal so these are two identical gradients of the exactly the same similar characteristics so you, you when you apply this so what happens you know when you apply this first gradient it you know it defaces the water molecules from their own location and then this water this gradient refaces these are in the opposite directions so this gradient refocuses 
all those water molecules in the same phase again. If there is no moment, then all the you know these protons or the nuclei will be rephased. But if there is a motion, if there is a diffusion process happening in this in this region. So what will happen? You will create it. You you will sensitize the you no know, tissues using this gradient. But because of the water molecules have moved from that location, so you won't be able to you know fully refocus all the nu nuclei to the original situation. So what will happen? There will be a drop in the signal because you no, know, not many signal you know nuclei are available for you know producing the signal. So it can be more you know easily depicted over here. Suppose we have three hydrogen atoms, three nuclei here. They are all in the same phase. Same arrow are shown from left to right. And then you apply this gradient. This is called diffusion gradient, dephasing gradient. What happens because of this gradient? These three spins now are in different phases. Okay, they are in different phases of because of this gradient. When you apply another gradient of the same amplitude in the negative direction, all these nuclei will rephase again. If there was no motion, if there is no diffusion ha process happening, all the nuclei will re regain its their own initial phase. So what happens when there is a moment? Again, situation same situation. We have three uh, hydrogen atoms. They are in phase, and then you apply a gradient, and then you see the because of this gradient, these phases have been changed. And after you and you know you are giving some time. Some of the you know molecules they have moved away from their location because of diffusion. When you reapply this pulse, again gradient pulse, only this nuclei you know which is stationary will have rephasing back. Other two will be dephased, and because of this dephasing, there is a signal loss, which can be detected by this diffusion-mediated imaging sequence. Is that clear? Uh, yes, okay, sir. And then Fine. This, this is the equation for the uh, uh, diffusion, uh, uh, like you had contrast for T1, T2 contrast. So diffusion is governed by this equation. S is equal to S not. E to power minus B D and D is the diffusion ADC or the diffusion coefficient. B is called the B factor. This is called the this is called B factor. And uh, S is the measured signal when you are applied the diffusion gradient. S not is signal without diffusion gradient. And B factor we will discuss B factor little later. But this is this is this we call a gradient you know gradient sensitive diffusion sensitizing factor. You know B factor is the gradient. Sensitivity factor, and this depends on several parameters. You can see gamma square is gyromagnetic ratio. G is the gradient field strength applied. Delta is the time of the pulse, gradient pulse, how, for how long this pulse was on, and then small build delta is the between two pulses. But when you apply first gradient pulse and the second pulse, the time duration between these two is this delta. Okay, so so this is how you calculate B. And then B value gives the degree of diffusion weighting, and it is related to the strength and duration of the pulse gradient as well as the interval between the gradients. So, so B changes the change. B is can be changed by lengthening the separation of the two gradient pulses, so that you give more time for molecules to move around, and you can have more signal loss, so that you can detect the these changes very accurately. So B factor is important. You can you can see here. This is a uh, you know image where B is zero. You have not applied any diffusion sensitizing gradient. So this image is exactly like T two image. What you saw earlier, it's exactly T two T two weighted image. And then you have a B factor of thousand. You can see this. There is a signal loss, and all the areas which had high diffusion, this there is a signal loss because these ventricles they have a lot of fluid. And fluids have high diffusion, so these these molecules have you no know, left the their original places, and this signal has become dark. You can see here, and when you take B factor of three thousand, you can see still the, the images. And you know, when, as you increase the B factor, you improve the you know uh, uh, contrast mechanism, but you are also losing the signal noise ratio. So you can see when there is a B of three thousand, you can see there is a picture is very grainy. That means signal noise ratio is much lower than the Other two images. 
and then uh, then in you know uh, for calculating you know from if you want to calculate uh, the uh, d from this equation you need to have two equations so that you can calculate d here so you can have you know uh, two b values b1 and b2 to, to calculate the you know this diffusion diffusion coefficient we'll come to this a little later we can show you this so usually you know you uh, in, when you are doing brain you use b value of 0 and b value of 1000 to create a you know diffusion weighted image in the brain but in body you can see here in the if the body if you use 0 b value 0 you see a lot of you know bright regions here in the this is the, this is the abdominal area you can see there are two kidneys and then liver and spleen and all that you can see there are a lot of you know regions which are you know bright here so if you, you should not confuse this with the you know uh, restricted diffusion so what you do you don't apply you don't use b of 0 in body apply you use lower value as 50 so there are all these you know areas which were bright here they already become dark so you can see the only areas where you have a restricted diffusion so and you know this has a great application in detection of stroke as i told you last time diffusion is the only technique which can show you stroke within few minutes of onset if you take a picture of a person who has a who had a stroke brain stroke and do the t2 weighted imaging you see no nothing in this image okay so you can miss the stroke if you do not perform diffusion weighted images and when you do diffusion weighted image on the same patient you can see there is a big insert big in fact, which has happened in the brain, the attack has happened in the brain. You can see huge area, and this is a restricted diffusion. When there is a restricted diffusion, the signals are bright. And when you have the ADC, you can see the diffusion is now the water molecules have not been able to move around too much. So you have diffusion coefficient or the ADC image is showing as dark here. So you can you can immediately make out whether there has been a stroke or any other pathology. And this is. This is, you know, uh, one of the greatest contribution of diffusion weighted imaging in clinical uh, setup because you can detect stroke within few minutes of onset. Because if you miss the stroke sometimes, and you and there's a concept of golden hour, if you bring the patient to the hospital within few early few few hours, the patient can be recouped and you can keep the defect can be rectified. If the patient because the spin echo image. Or the CT scan will show this stroke only after 24 hours, and by that time, all the damage would have happened to the patient. So it is very important to do diffusion weighted imaging if you if you suspect somebody had a stroke, brain stroke. So now uh, in diffusion weighted images, see bright regions means there is a restricted diffusion, decreased water diffusion. If you see a bright signal like this, that means diffusion has been restricted not too much of diffusion is there. If you see a dark region here, that means there's a increased water diffusion. You know, you can see here ventricles, you have a ventricles, you have a fluid free diffusion. You, these areas are shown as dark. Here there's a restricted diffusion. You see this is as bright. So these are the, some of the, you know, uh, you, know uh, uh, you know, conditions where you have a restricted diffusion, you have example the infarction, uh, diffused hypoxic injury, posterior reversible encephalopathy, and neoplastic lesion with lymphomas, epidermoids. You know, all these have you know restricted diffusion, and they will be shown as bright on diffusion weighted image, but as dark signal on the ADC image. So you can they can immediately be you know detected using uh, diffusion MRI, and one can make. Uh, uh, make the correct diagnosis of the patient. So there are several, you know, uh, conditions where there is a restricted diffusion. Now coming to the, you know, uh, as I said, this is the, you know, signal that we had from spin echo. Uh, this is a signal, is, you know, proportional to the number of nuclei you have, the proton density, the T1 factor and the T2 factor. When you talk about di diffusion weighted image, you have a T2 component, proton density, and the one more factor is added, which is a diffusion diffusion factor. So this is the equation which governs the diffusion weighted images. And then you have, as I told you, you have to have two images 
to calculate the ADC map. We are, we are calculating D. So you need at least two images. So we have two images with zero and thousand. Then you can calculate the ADC by, by the formula. And this algorithm can be applied on the image so that every pixel on this ADC image shows the you know, diffusion uh, you know, parameter. It shows the ADC of that particular region. So this is very like you had T2 weighted image, T2 calculation Im calculated image, likewise your you know you know diffusion calculated image or the ADC image. So ADC image is the really uh, of high diagnostic value. So this is how mathematical mathematics goes into calculating the ADC image. And then you can also, uh, as I said, if you want to extend the diffusion measurement in several directions, then you can have diffusion coefficient in multiple directions like you have this is the 90 degree pulse this is this you know slice selection gradient which you applied for a slice then you applied this is in the uh, slice selection direction one of the diffusion gradient then you have 100 degree pulse then another diffusion gradient similarly you are applying in all the three directions these diffusion gradients you can see here then you can produce uh, images this is a diffusion weighted image in z direction if you apply you know uh, gradient in the diffusion gradient in z direction this is diffusion weighted image when you applied a gradient in x direction this is a diffusion weighted image when you applied gradient in y direction so you can see the difference between the three images you can see the bright areas and dark areas how they are changing in these in these three images so because you are applying now you are sensitizing diffusion in a particular direction now in z x or y direction then you can also make a, you know, uh, the average of the three and uh, and divide that pixels by three. Then you have diffusion weighted or isotropic or trace image. This is called trace image. And uh, this is a basically, a, this is again not a ADC image. It is a diffusion weighted image, but average diffusion in all the three directions. You know, this diffusion, as I said, it doesn't happen in one direction. It can happen in many directions. So you can calculate the net diffusion uh, net displacement in, in the in the tissue uh, by doing uh, you know diffusion weighted measurement in all the three directions. Here you can see the diffusion weighted or trace image of stroke. You can again see here how it has become dark on the ADC map. So it is you know it is nice you know to to find out whether this was a restricted diffusion and on ADC it will become dark. So that means there has been some insult to the tissue because of which the, you know, the diffusion has become restricted. Otherwise, in brain, the diffusion should be unrestricted, you know, it should be free. But because of this insert, this are because of this injury in the brain, you know, these water molecules are not allowed to move much because of debris and that, you know, the tissues which have been, you know, uh, or the, you know, debris which are there because of stroke, they don't allow these molecules to move freely in the tissue so that is the reason you find this then there's a you know some uh, some of the phenomena which happen in uh, you know diffusion light bulb sign then t2 shine through these are some of the you know uh, difficulties when you look at the images of diffusion and then you know uh, so you have different mechanism so that is why you know if you want to give diagnosis it is you should always bank upon ADC image rather than diffusion weighted image. So these are some of the reasons I can show you some results. So this is a light bulb sign in stroke. So what happens, there are some areas which already have T2, high T2. When high T2 is there and superimpose diffusion in a restricted diffusion, the areas become more bright. So that means light bulb, it's a light bulb sign we call it. So it has become more brighter. So, but you know, so, so the combined effect of T2 and diffusion weighted effect is T2 lengthens, T2 weighted image goes bright. ADC is reduced because of the restricted diffusion. So this, you get a double brightness on the image. Okay. So you can see here. So there's a lesion, lesion here. You can see here. This is a trace image, diffusion weighted image. And then this is a ADC image. So this is a T2 weighted image. Spin echo image. You can see this is bright here also, here also. That means this is a this is bright because of T2 effect. T2 is high in this region, 
and because of restricted field, this is also showing bright region. When you add, get ADC map, you can see this is not that bright. So that means this this area doesn't have so much of restricted diffusion. Otherwise, you will mis mis mislead it by a very very restricted diffusion. So it is not so much restricted. So your diagnosis will be entirely different when you have this is quality to shine through, and you have to create ADC map if you want to look at these uh, things carefully. And this is a whole body diffusion image. You can see there are you know uh, like you you know about PET scan. PET scan is used uh, very uh, commonly to do the you know uh, look at the you know metastasis uh, because of cancer, and then you can see all the regions in the brain uh, in the body wherever this cancer has spread. So whole body diffusion wetting imaging can also give you PET like image where the different you know metastatic lesions can be shown over the whole body, and this is catching up and you know maybe uh, uh, from few years from now. You may no, not need PET scan to look at the metastatic lesions in the in, in the body. You can go for a whole body diffusion weighted imaging. This is again uh, not so much common, but people are developing this technique so that you know you don't need to expose the patient to you know the the nuclear isotope or the you know uh, PET radiopharmaceuticals. So this is another area where it is gaining a lot of importance. So you can see here, you know, uh, this is FCIS. You can see in thousand, you can see the bright region here. Now you see only here the, the, the you know bright region. That means there is restricted diffusion. So people can think of this as a stroke. Okay. When you do create ADC image, you can see there is only a small portion which is you know there, which is which has a restricted diffusion. But there is a lot of you no know, free uh, uh, you know uh, movement around this region. So this is the edema. That means this is the abscess, not stroke. So you can this is how you can differentiate between stroke and the you know abscess in, in in the tissues in the brain. So uh, clinical applications are several. The restricted diffusion or low ADC is seen in stroke, in the abscess, in the epidermoid, in the cellular tumors, lymphomas, and medulla medulla uh, carcinomas. And elevated diffusion is seen in edema, CSF, encephalomalacia, and chronic MS lesions. In all these, you know, uh, disease conditions, you will see elevated diffusion. That means ADC will be high, or, or in the ADC image, you will see a bright signal. Here you will have a low ADC. That means you will see a, you will see a uh, no small uh, uh, dark signal. Now extended this to the uh, diffusion tensor imaging, which is a non-invasive way of understanding brain structural connectivity. Last time we discussed about the functional connectivity. Now we are talking about the structural connectivity. This is how exactly the brain regions are connected to each other through these white matter fiber tracks. Like the I gave an example last time, how the you know circuit board on the circuit boards, the components are you know connected through the tracks. Similar way here, the different regions, the gray matter regions. Are connected uh, with each other through these white matter fiber tracks, which can be visualized using uh, DTI, and uh, and the contrast is based on the directional rate of the diffusion of water molecule. So it is exactly studying the diffusion, you know, the direction of the diffusion processes happening in the brain to create these generate these maps. So this we have seen this uh, diffusion isotropic and isotropic. And this is how you know the uh, the the you know white matter fiber tracks look like. You have these you know fiber tracks, and there's a myelin sheath, which is a sort of insulation over these you know track or the on these wires, which we uh, can visualize. So again, these are length and they are elongated. So they and the diffusion can be you know in all the three directions. So they can be defined. The diffusion in these anisotropic medium can be defined as a ellipsoid, not as a you know sphere. If you have a sphere, that means there's a isotropic diffusion. That means diffusion is you know same in all directions. If you have an isotropic diffusion, the diffusion has to be you know modeled using a ellipsoid like this. So it can it has three directions: the longer direction and the other two directions. So they are called lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. So this is how the diffusion is represented using a ellipsoid. 
So uh, this is the diffusion tensor uh, matrix, and this is shown as dx x and dx x d y y d z z are the diffusion A D C components in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction. This is all matrix manipulations you have to do to create a diffusion uh, map, and uh, so. Uh, once you have this uh, diffusion uh, tensor matrix then you have these lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 values and using these values you can calculate the anisotropy as well as the uh, uh, the diffusion adc so fractional anisotropy is given by this formula is written here fractional anisotropy is under root 3 by 2 lambda 1 minus d and d is you know lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 average of the three uh, lambdas is the d or you can use lambda bar which is the you know uh, average of the three, average of diffusion in three orientations so this fa is a fractional anisotropy it is you know it can be zero if the you know the medium is isotropic it will have a zero, value of zero if the medium is completely anisotropic it can have value one so that means it will have value of between zero and one always okay so this is how you you calculate this you know from the uh, from the image you apply this formula and then calculate each, you can create a fa map and you can see now how these fiber tracks are visualized on the fa maps because now you are able to see the diffusion process is happening in preferential direction you can you are able to see these white matter fiber tracks very clearly and then uh, you also have mean diffusivity or the adc which is as I said, the average of lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. So there are these are the two parameters which are very important. One is fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity. These are the two parameters which are very important when you talk about DTI, and you can actually compute these values and do a quantitative measurement of the diffusion processes in brain or elsewhere in the tissue. So here it is showing if there's a CSF, you can see. Uh, CSF has a, uh, you know, uh, unrestricted diffusion so, and isotropic diffusion, it will be a bigger sphere because, you know, diffusion is free in this region. You can see a big sphere as isotropic diffusion. This is depiction of, you know, how gray matter has also free diffusion, but not so much free as CSF. So you can see a smaller sphere, but, but diffusion is isotropic, you see a sphere. And you can, if you look at the white matter fiber tracks, the diffusion is represented by a ellipsoid because it has it has a preferential direction along the axis of the ellipsoid and there are other two directions also which will these are lamb, lambda one is the longer direction lambda two lambda three are the other two directions here so these are you know then you can generate these maps this is the longitudinal map or the lambda one or the fa map you can see these are the fiber tracks now you are able to visualize uh, in the brain, how nicely they are visualized. This is a uh, this is this is called mean diffusivity. This is lambda two plus lambda three divided by two, and these are the two. One are the you know uh, actual diffusivity as well as you know the uh, these these are the two other parameters which were visualized here. This is FA. This is mean diffusivity in all the three directions. This is a uh, lambda one or the actual diffusivity. This is the uh, radial diffusivity. The lambda one, lambda two plus lambda three divided by two. So these are four parameters which can be calculated, and these parameters tell you about the integrity of the white matter fiber tracks, which we will see a little later. So generally, you know what happens whenever there is a disease process the fa values always decrease because because of the disruption of the tissues there's a the, the diffusion gets restricted and the anisotropy reduces so you will always have a fraction anisotropy reduced in most of the times you will find fa reduced and md increased so this is a general you know uh, uh, phenomenon that happens in the tissue when tissue is damaged but when you if you are but again if you are giving a training or a new set of you know uh, you know, uh, skills to a person because of the use of these fibers, uh, frequent use of these fibers, the FA values can increase in very few conditions. Usually, when there's a disease process, 
FA values always decreases and MD always increases. You can see most of the times it happens like that. Now, you know, after you generate this FA map, then you can color code them. And here the colors, no, these colors are not for beautification colors. The colors tell you the direction of the diffusion. If you see the fibers which are in red, that means diffusion is happening from left to right. The water diffusion is taking place from left to right or right to left, either ways. Okay. If you have blue fibers, you can see fibers of blue. That means you are looking at anterior to posterior axis. Sorry, superior to inferior. That means it is from head to toe. So these these are fibers are from head to toe. I'm sorry. This is from front to back. Blue will be front to back, and then green is from head to toe. So you can exa exactly looking at the colors. You can look at what is the directionality of these diffusion processes. So red is left to right, blue is in and out or you know front to back, and then green is foot, head to toe. So these are the three directions or three colors given, and then intensity of this color will tell you about the anisotropy. If you find a very bright red color. That it means it means it has a high anisotropy. The value is approaching one. Okay, so these are the, both the things are depicted by the same same uh, parameters. So these are some of the you know you know uh, fibers which have been generated here. These are the major fibers fiber tracks in the brain which are generated using diffusion tensor imaging. So this is again uh, you can see how beautifully this is a. Corpus callosum, which you know, uh, this goes from left to right. This connects the two hemispheres of the brain. This is called corpus callosum. It's the large, largest fiber tracts which connect the two hemispheres of the brain. You can see the color is red here, and then these are the. This is a green. Uh, you can see this is from eye eyeball to occipital cortex. These are fibers, fiber bundles, which can be reconstructed using diffusion tensor imaging. So it has a great application in pre-surgical planning. So suppose there is a tumor in the in the region, and these are the fibers. You know, these fibers can be pushed by this tumor. So that means fibers are intact, but they have been just pushed out. Sometimes you know these tumors they infiltrate into the fibers, and the fibers are you know uh, bro broken. You know, or they are you know some of the fibers get broken, and here are some addiction. You know, there is a tissue adipotomous tissue. But fibers are intact, and sometimes you know fibers can be destroyed by the pathology. So the surgeon can look at these images and find out whether the patient is really you know surgical surgically viable. If the surgery is viable in such patients or not. If you find situation like this that the fibers have been destroyed, that means the function of that person has already been you know uh, disabled. So there is no point of doing surgery on such patient because. The patient will not recover from the, the damage what has happened already in the brain or 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 on his functioning. But if the fiber is like this, the tumor is just pushing or infiltrated, so he can just remove the tumor and so that the, these fibers can come back to their original original positions and the person can you know live a normal life. So this is a very good application of DTIS peer surgical planning. The surgeon can look at the images and see whether the fibers are really Destroyed or they are intact. They are only being pushed by the tumor, and the tumor can be removed. And you no, know, you can see example here. There is a big tumor sitting over here, and this is a you know a front occipital cord, you know fasciculus, which is a fiber which is from which goes from eye to occipital cortex. You can see this is a green throughout. So this is a intact fiber, and here on this side there is a tumor, and then this, this tumor is pushing this fiber. Usually, it should have come like this. Can you see this fiber? You know, I'm moving my cursor. Usually, it should have been like this, but because of this tumor, this is being inside. Okay, but fiber looks like they are intact. So, if the tumor is removed, the surgeon dissects the tumor out. The surgeon, this fiber will go back to the normal direction. The person will start seeing and know the the uh, impairment, whatever has happened. If the patient can be patient can recover from this uh, situation. So this is how you know you can generate the map and see the tumor versus fibers, and then after the tumor is removed, because the surgeon has to be very careful. If he even cuts a small portion of the fiber, the patient will be you know will have 
paralytic thing attack on that particular function. If it is a you know a vision visionary part, then you will have problems with the vision. So surgeons have to be very careful in removing this tumor before they operate on the patient. So this is a nice application of you know pre-surgical planning. So this is a tractrocaphy. These are the brain. This is a you know normal brain, normal uh, person who's you can see these fibers are intact in both the, in both the uh, hemispheres from eyeball to the occipital cortex. You can see here this is a person who is you know blind by uh, by birth. You can see these fibers have never connected, and this this person is blind by birth. You can see there's no connection between the two fibers which are you know. The, this is a disjoint of fibers in this region, and this is a case where the you know the person has you know has blindness because of the uh, injury, and you can see these fibers are trying to connect, but you know they are still not connected. Suppose by some method or some uh, miracle these fibers connect, then this patient will start seeing again. So you can see how nicely these fibers can be shown on the images in a healthy control which has a normal vision and in a person who has no vision since his childhood or the from the birth this could be a congenital you no know, blindness in this case and here you can see this accidental case or the uh, you know the fiber uh, damage due to some you know illness um, so this is how one can show this and this is a uh, diffusion tensor uh, imaging on a on alcoholic brain you can see how the diffusion fibers are thinning out that means fractional anisotropy is reduced in these uh, in these patients who are alcoholic and compared to the you know uh, the healthy controls you can see how these thin fibers are thinned out so that means fa values are decreased in this and you can see this is a quantitative method of showing you know uh, the fa values here you can see uh, uh, this is a one is controlled, two is alcoholic. You can see how the FA values in different regions. This is a corpus callosum, inferior fasciculus, occipital fasciculus, superior uh, lateral fasciculus. You know these all regions. You know in fornix, and then uh, uh, these are the ADR and UNC uncinate cortex. You can see how these you know FA values are decreased. In alcoholics compared to healthy controls, so you can actually quantify uh, these parameters. Similar way, the, you know, uh, you can also look at the you know uh, the the uh, the MD values. Also, you can see how the MD increases in this case. So, uh, diffusion tensor tracking, you can use the diffusion tensor data for tracing neural fibers in the white matter, and they have great potential in uh, pre-surgical planning. Previously, they could only be seen on the cadavers, you know, because this 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 technique only can show you these fibers uh, in in this way. Otherwise, in the earlier days, only cadavers were open, the brains were open, and one could look at the you know uh, uh, these fibers, uh, the in integrated these fibers in the brain. So this is you know how you have you generate these fibers. You look at the, you know these these are the boxes, and you see the anisotropy in the direction. And you you look at how you generate. This is ten percent. Then you see the longest diffusion. So now it is fifteen around this. Fifteen said suddenly it is thirty now. So it will connect here, thirty. Then it will go to fifty and then ninety and then ninety. And this is how these fibers are generated depending on the L lambda one. You, lambda one is the latest. These are the ellipsoid. You can look at the lambda ones here. And as and when lambda one is increasing, you will go on. Tracing that path, so this 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 doesn't take 10, 15, 10. It is take, taking 10, then 15, and then it doesn't take 20 because there's a 30 longer lambda one. So it will go like this, and this, and then the fibers are generated. You can see how fibers get generated on these images. So these are some of the you know fibers which have been generated. This this is a you know uh, these are not from MRI. This is you know images from the atlas. You can see how beautifully MRI can you know reproduce these fibers by non-NSC methods. So you can see these are the tractography uh, 
these are really good pictures of the white bit of fiber drive. They, these are in 64 directions 3D. You can see how beautifully these fibers are you know shown in in different orientations and they are different colors. And you know one can really frame this as a you know painting in your room. You can how beautiful and this is a high resolution you know uh, tractography. You can see how small small fibers, very thin fibers are depicted on these images. So I uh, finish this diffusion tensor. And if you want to have five minutes break, then we come to the next lecture. Okay, sir. Uh, you can have a break for sort of, uh, five minutes or so. Okay. Right. Okay. And by the time participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, ask or write in the chat box. I think I went a little fast today, right? It's okay. It's okay. Any question? No, no. Are there any questions? Uh, no, no questions as, okay. as such. Okay. Okay, just uh, relax for five minutes, then you can start again. Can I start? You would like to start immediately or you want to take a little rest? Depends on you. No, okay. It's, you, are, you are only doing that job. You are just sitting. Maybe two minutes will start. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, Professor Kusho, if you like, you can start. Oh, okay, start. thank you. Okay. So, uh, my next topic is uh, MR spectroscopy. Uh, here, in the first lecture, in the ninth lecture, we will talk about proton spectroscopy or hydrogen spectroscopy and its application in brain. And then, uh, next uh, lecture, we will cover the multinuclear spectroscopy, that means nuclei other than hydrogen uh, which are in in practice 
so uh, so this is another parameter the we talked about the contrast parameters in mri or the nmr and this is a contrast parameter which is called chemical shift the whole spectroscopy is based on the concept of chemical shifts and uh, so so what is an mr spectral it gives it is a window to metabolic processes in the human body so it gives you idea about what are the metabolic you know reactions which are taking place and what are the by products how these by products are changing with with the disease process or otherwise uh, when you, suppose you are doing some uh, some exercise how you are you know metabolic change in the you know in the and uh, in metabolism energy metabolism changes so you can sh you can look at these processes happening within the uh, within in vivo conditions so uh, so uh, the difference between uh, imaging is image you have a image and you look at the different structures in the brain or in the tissue and you know make conclusions about the disease processes while as in uh, spectroscopy you look at the peaks you look at the, you know uh, spectrum like this and then you know define what what type of you know disease processes are setting up setting up because of the change in the metabolic levels because of the altered metabolic you know status in these patients so this is the basic difference between imaging and spectroscopy so uh, magnetic you know spectroscopy uh, can uh, can have many candidates like hydrogen phosphorus carbon 13 sodium 23 lithium fluorine you know uh, nitrogen 15 17 o 13 and potassium and but most of the commonly used in uh, as on today because the other nuclei have very low sensitivity so most of the commonly used nuclei are hydrogen and phosphorus though there are people who are doing sodium imaging as well but uh, 13 carbon 13 uh, unfortunately carbon 12 which has which is a major uh, you know isotope of carbon it is not nmr sensitive carbon 13 is but it has a very low sensitivity and uh, you know uh, in nature it is not so uh, very uh, you know less available so carbon 13 becomes different difficult unless you enrich uh, uh, the the you you do the enrichment of the uh, of the tissues using carbon 13 uh, isotope so uh, most of the work is in hydrogen and uh, phosphorus spectroscopy and as we know uh, we all know that we have you know this these all these nuclei have different uh, resonance frequencies so they are quite away from each other except fluorine and hydrogen which are closer 60 and 63 megahertz at 1.5 tesla carbon you know phosphorus 31 is at 26 megahertz and carbon 13 is at 16 megahertz so you can see how these nuclei are uh, frequency wise they are quite away so multi multi nuclear spectroscopy is is can be performed uh, in the sing, single shot by throwing two pulses at different resonance frequencies and one can acquire signal from two different nuclei simultaneously and uh, as i said ns spectroscopy based is based on the chemical shifts the hydrogen uh, spectroscopy the, the chemical shifts are very close from 0 to 10 ppm you see all the you know uh, metabolites within this ppm so the peaks are very closer there there are the splitting and then you know peaks get overlapped so it is it becomes a little difficult to look at the hydrogen spectra but when it come to 13c spectra those sensitivity is low but peaks are very away you know they are quite far away so there is no confusion of detecting the peaks and there is no peak overlap so much overlap in the carbon 13 so it can be about 250 250 ppm the whole spectrum all the you know the 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 uh, components of carbon 13 can be visualized using uh, uh, nmr spectroscopy and in phosphorus you have minus 70 to plus 7 7.5 ppm so all the energy metabolites which are available in the body can be visualized between between this so so hydrogen becomes a little difficult and mostly because you know these metabolites are at millimolar concentrations and you know water in body is you know 70 molar so you can see uh, how difficult it must be to pick up the metabolites which are in millimolar concentration against the water which is at 70 molar concentration so you can see how uh, uh, the uh, hydrogen spectroscopy becomes complex so uh, you know uh, we have 
when we talk of edema spectroscopy we are in we go in a spectroscopy which we usually call mrs magnetic resonance spectroscopy or clinical spectroscopy is called mrs then you have in vitro high resolution nmr spectroscopy and all people who are in chemistry they know how nmr is used for structural elucidation of you know molecules and then uh, nmr in biology medicine uh, high resolution nmr where you can take body fluids you know urine you know blood or saliva or you know csf and perform high resolution nmr to look at the you know uh, fingerprints or markers you know uh, disease markers or different disease conditions this is a new emerging area which is called metabolomic you look at the metabolic profile uh, within the body and uh, look at uh, and you may find uh, many people have found some marker biomarkers of a disease process by using uh, nmr metabolomics and uh, then another technique which is called x y y nmr spectroscopy where the you know the tumor or you know the area can be removed and you know it can be measured x y o by uh, imaging uh, method or through high resolution nmr uh, you know with instruments so so the mars spectrum looks like this it has you know frequency axis uh, here and then amplitude of the signals you can look at uh, how it uh, see it looks at the, the 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 frequency tells you about the details of the you know constituent of that metabolite which metabolite correspond to this chemical shift there is lot of work done and people have made directories so you don't have to really find out uh, if you are seeing a peak here at 2 ppm in hydrogen spectrum you don't have to really break your head to see what peak is this you can refer to the you know directory you know the database and find out what is the you know metabolite here at 2 ppm so you can see you know these ppm and the vertical axis here you know this axis the amplitude tells about your concentration of this particular uh, you know uh, nuclei or the metabolite so this is uh, uh, you know process of any uh, spectroscopy technique uh, every every place uh, every spectroscopy has the same same uh, concept so nmr spectroscopy has you know mostly four components the chemical shifts the peak full width half maximum then line broadening and peak splitting and j coupling these are some of the parameters which you encounter while doing nmr spectroscopy so this is how the uh, nmr peak looks like so this is the peak amplitude and then you can also you know find out the area under this peak if the peaks are very sharp you know just line a sort of a line then peak amplitude will tell you about the concentration of that particular you know compound or the metabolite if the peak is a little broader like this then you can find the area under this curve and find out the concentration of this particular uh, you know molecule or the metabolite and then uh, you have full width half maximum you can calculate the uh, width at half maximum this is a maximum amplitude at half m amplitude if you calculate the width of this spectrum it gives you full width half maximum so this tells you about the homogeneity of the magnetic field and also you, when you shim the magnet this this gives the idea about how good you is, is your shimming this also gives you idea about, about your t2 uh, t2 star of the you know tissue or the metabolite of that particular metabolite so then you have this there could be you know in this this is a tissue from the tissue you can see a tissue peak water peak and the fat peak so then these peaks are you know away from each other uh, by some chemical shift of 3.5 ppm so these are all uh, this is how the mr nmr spectrum looks like so now uh, the concept of chemical shift is you know you know the if you look at the uh, hydrogen in in fat or hydrogen in water they are in sitting in a totally chemical different chemical environment so the shielding of you know uh, uh, the electron cloud which is around the nucleus shields these two hydrogen atoms very differently and then because of this shielding uh, different shielding the hydrogen atoms in fat and water are in two different you know molecules they look they see the different magnetic fields external magnetic field is shielded so they see less or more magnetic field depending on whether this field is opposing the main magnetic field or is adding to the main magnetic field so then because of this change in magnetic field there will be change in resonance frequencies and there will be a change in the you know position peak positions in the 
NMR spectrum. So we call it chemical shift, the change in frequency. And because of differences in electron shielding, identical nuclei resonate at different frequencies like hydrogen in fat and water. They resonate at different frequency. Now, you know, the, it is, you know, you can calculate, you know, this uh, chemical shift in, you know, hertz. But the problem is, you know, this chemical shift in hertz will change from magnetic field strength to field strength. If you are using one, one Tesla magnet, there will be certain hertz. Then if you go to 1.5 Tesla, then it will be few more hertz. So it is better to make it field independent. So we make a major chemical shift in, you know, in, in PPM, in PPM levels. So the chemical shift is, this is water, you know, uh, frequency of water minus frequency of fat divided by 10 to the power 6. So this is how you calculate, you know, the chemical shift of. So this is, we have found the delta of water and fat is 3.5 ppm. That means chemical shift of fat in water is 3.5 ppm, which is independent of field strength. Now you, whether you work on 7 Tesla magnet or 12 Tesla magnet or 1 Tesla magnet, this will remain 3.5 ppm. And for one Tesla magnet, one PPM will be about 42. I mean, 42 hertz. No, because 42.5 into 10 power 6 is a frequency. So you can calculate what is the, you know, in hertz, how much will be the, you know, this chemical shift. But to make it feel independent, you make major this in, you know, PPM. By convention, signals of weakly shielded nuclei with higher frequency are on the left of the spectrum. Signal of more heavily shielded nuclei with lower frequency are on the right. So this is a convention in the in the when you look at the NMR spectrum. And chemical shift of water, you know, in the tissue is set to 4.7 uh, ppm at body temperature. If you if the body temperature is changing, there could be a little shift in the water peak. But generally at body temperature, the chemical shift of water is 4.7 ppm. And we measure all most of the peaks with respect in, in body. In 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 vitro NMR, you use external you no know, reference TMS or you know methylsaline, you know whatever you want to use. But here you know this internal reference is used, which is water for looking at the chemical shifts of different metabolites. So uh, this is again depicted here. More shielded is on the uh, right hand side, and the less shielded is on the left hand side. And this is a you know chemical shift increasing scale. And we also call this up field and this is called down field. So these are different nomenclatures which are, you know, uh, given to the, this, uh, you know, the, the chemical shift scales. So this is a uh, chemical shift. This is a spectrum from the brain, human brain. You can see different metabolites which are shown here. This is at 1.5 Tesla and this is at 3 Tesla. And you know the signal to noise ratio and the sensitivity improves when you do you know experiments using high tesla magnets you can see there are so many peaks visualized on three tesla which are not visualized well on you no know, 1.5 tesla there are essentially only three four peaks which are well visualized on 1.5 tesla but when you go to three tesla you see so many peaks the na polyene creatinine then minus tall glx you know the glutamate 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 all these peaks can be visualized on uh, high Tesla magnets. And if you look at the chemical shift of uh, hydrogen entities, you have, uh, if TMS is here as a reference at zero, then uh, you have, you know, alkenes will be here in this region. So this is a region which is, you know, basically for a fat and, you know, these liquids, etc. between point, uh, point 0.9 ppm to 1.3 ppm, you will see all lipids. 1.3 will see lactate. And likewise, you know, this is how all these, you know, carboxylic acid will be around 10 to 12 ppm. Aldehydes will be in this range. Amides will be in this 6 to 8 ppm. Aromatics are in this range about 6.5 to 9 ppm. You can see all these, you know, constituents, hydrogen entities are, you know, placed in these chemical shift ranges. And you can see, look at the, you know, you know, database where it will tell you all components which are possible, uh, which, which all have been identified, you can look at and find out the chemical shift or different constituents of hydrogen entities. 
so we talked about the full width half pixel is a very important parameter when you do a spectroscopy because for spectroscopy you need a very high homogeneity of the magnetic field and uh, as i said the peak position depends on chemical shift now if you know the chemical shift in a spectrum you can immediately refer to the you know the uh, the database and say what metabolite or what chemical is present in that location and the size and the shape of the peak depends on concentration of the active nuclei t1 and t2 effects inhomogeneity effects as i told you t2 star you all know now what t2 star means then hidden or overlapping peaks. there are a lot of peaks which are very close chemical shifts and because you know your homogeneity is not so good these peaks are overlapped so it is difficult to you know separate these peaks in vivo of course in vitro you have much you know better ways to do it but in in vivo conditions sometimes they are difficult to you know separate and then uh, there could be splitting or j coupling uh, uh, in the in the different peaks which we'll see little later on the you know some of the spectrum so then as i showed, told you you know the shimming plays a very important role in uh, line broadening or you know uh, the you know presentation of the peaks you can see this is a well shimmed magnet you can see the peak is, peaks are very sharper here full width half maximum is much smaller than compared to this peak this is a poor shim magnet you can see these peaks you know are these peaks are now you know they are looking like a doublet doublet here but they are not doublet they are actually separate peaks you have which are shown over here very nicely you can see how well these peaks are resolved if you are doing a well if you are working with a well shimmed magnet so i think uh, all of you know uh, the uh, how this j coupling takes place and this this is a example of lactate and lactate has you know uh, a doublet at uh, doublet and quartet quartet in different uh, chemical shifts which we will see uh, in in uh, subsequent slides so this is you all know this pascal uh, triangle and this all these peaks when they have you know this is a 1331 pattern where the you know these four you know quadrate has you know four peaks and then the ratio of the amplitudes is 1331 and yeah, this interpret this is 1 uh, to 1 is uh, the center peak is two times the amplitude of the you know other two peaks you can see how these the determination of these you know patterns of the splitting uh, and heights is you know determined and uh, this uh, lactate has a lactate is a very important peak in uh, in 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 tumors and other areas where there is a you know cirrhosis takes place and uh, when you have anaerobic uh, glycolysis you see lactate and you can see you have to see the peaks at uh, ch3 uh, the methyl group of lactate is a 1.31 ppm whereas the you know ch is quadrate is at 4.10 ppm and then this is uh, very nicely Depicting depicted over here, you can see this is a uh, uh, CS3. You can see one is to one. Uh, both the peaks have equal amplitude. This is you know the quadrate at four point one zero. You can see one three three one determination of these, and this is how these spins are. These these uh, amplitudes are determined by the spin states uh, on the on the spectrum. So now lactate lactate has a very uh, you know. Uh, characteristic signal you know uh, usually you will find lactate peak always you know inverted like this and in in the in vivo conditions so if you if you see a doublet like this it may be a noise or lactate but if you want to confirm that this is a lactate then you must acquire another spectra with echo time of 288 milliseconds anything less than you know 200 milliseconds you will see a inverted lactate suppose this is you want to confirm this is lactate or not you make another spectrum at 288 milliseconds and if this is elected this will you know become this will reverse again and you will show a positive peak over here so and every you know when n is odd even you will see up elected and when it is down will or at odd n you know you will have the reverse uh, elected peak and now uh, when you look at the mr sensitivity to the local magnetic fields the mr signals are typically acquired without imposing magnetic field gradients because 
in the initial stages when there's only FID sequence was used for acquiring uh, spectroscopy signals, there was no use of any gradients at that time. But if you want to localize a region in the brain or in the tissue, you want to acquire a spectrum or the you know metabolic profile from a selected area, then you have to apply magnetic field gradients as you do in you know in, in imaging. So what you do basically you select a region in the brain or in the tissue where you want to acquire the signal. You do a localization, and this localization done is based on you do an imaging first and then localize your area in the, in the images, then put your voxel in that location, then you do a shimming on that location, on, the, on that voxel, so that within the voxel, within that region of interest, you have high homogeneity. Then you do, because I just told you that water is in very high concentrations, you have to suppress the water before you see the metabolites. So you do a water suppression, and then you do a uh, spectroscopic acquisition. So this is, uh, you know, when water is suppressed, then only you can see all these small, small concentration metabolites in the spectrum. If you have a very huge water peak, nothing of this sort will be seen uh, in the in the spectrum. You can see this is a water peak which has not been suppressed. You see only this, and you see very small, small peaks which are as good as noise in the spectrum. But as soon as as soon as you suppress water you can start seeing all other peaks very nicely. So the, there's a separate method. You have to put a water suppression pulses uh, in uh, and chess is one of the variants which is very you know commonly used to suppress water in the in the in vivo uh, NMR. So this is a uh, spectrum of the brain at four Tesla. You can see this is a lactate here, and then Na and S style aspartate, glutamine and glutamate, then GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, then choline and creatine. All these peaks are very well visualized, including uh, the glutamate and glutamine, which are separated out by this four Tesla magnet. And this is a complete, you know, uh, you know, uh, the uh, database of different you know metabolites and you and their corresponding chemical shifts so one can always refer to this you know this table and see what are the you know metabolites present in your spectrum though you know the spectrum labels the known metabolites automatically but in case you find some some in some disease process if you find some metabolite at some odd chemical shift then you can refer to the atlas and you know see which which uh, you know uh, which metabolite you are referring to. So this is the complete uh, guide of the you know, chemical shifts and the uh, components. So this is a uh, ex vivo mouse brain uh, at 11.4 Tesla. You can see how beautiful uh, you know, these all metabolites are seen on this. Uh, and But this is at a very high Tesla magnet. You can see this must be a very costly affair to produce spectrum like this. From the, from the, you know, you can see valine, leucine, isoleucine, alanine, GABA, acetate, GABA, glutamate, glutamine, succinate, citrate, all these peaks, all these metabolites can be very well visualized in ex vivo or in vitro samples. But we are very far away from this type of spectra when we are dealing with in vivo, in vivo NMR uh, spectroscopy. So these are the, you know, some of the metabolites which are seen in brain. The highest peak is the N style aspartate, which is visualized at 2.07 ppm. This is present primarily in neurons, a marker of this is a marker of neuronal density and viability. And this is decreased in all the disease process that destroys. If the neurons are destructed or they are damaged, neurons are you know diseased, then NA peak will go down. You can see NA will always get down in meta metastatic regions non neuroplasmas plasmas, meningiomas, and you know, uh, there's only one disease which is called Kahneman's disease where the NA is high. Otherwise, in all most of the neurodegenerative diseases, whether it is MS, tumor, stroke, dementia, epilepsy, everywhere, since them, you know, there's a neural damage, so NA peak will go down. And uh, then there's a creatine, 
which has two peaks at uh, 3 ppm and 3.9 ppm corresponding to blue, blue and red hydrogens here. This is a methyl group and the you know, CH2 group. These are two different locations you will find these peaks. And uh, peak include both creatine and phosphoretine, uh, in, which are involved in energy metabolism. And uh, this is produced in liver and transported to brain where its level is relatively constant. And most of the times we take creatine as a internal standard to calculate the other, other uh, metabolites. Then there's a choline, which is the third tallest peak, which has a chemical shift of 3.5, 3.2 ppm. And then include dominant contribution from phosphorolicoline and glycophosphorolicoline. Free choline continues to go in normal brain. And this is a this tells you about the membrane turnover or the you know it is always elevated in disease with high membrane turnover like ischemia, demyelination, tumors, inflammation, these peaks. So when when disease process sets in, the concentration of these metabolites change and one can make inferences on the depending on the type of concentration changes, one can make uh, no con inferences about the disease. Then minus at all is a peak which has multiple peaks largest at 3.6 ppm and uh, it is like glucose like metabolite found principally in isocytes and this is a basically a you know a, a, you know uh, osmotic regulator you can say regulate the cellular volume and uh, due to short t2 it has a very short t2 it is all, always seen on the low uh, short t uh, sequences and it is elevated in neonates glycolysis acute demyelination Schwannomas, tubercular uh, sclerosis, particle dysplasia. These are the you know conditions in which this minus toll is raised, and this is also raised in dementia and Alzheimer's. In all these cases, the uh, minus toll is raised. Then comes the glutamate and glutamine, and uh, you know glutamate is a major excitatory neurotransmitter raised by neurons, and uh, glutamate and glutamate resonate closely together. There are some peak when we you know in, in vivo conditions it is very difficult to you know measure them separately so we measure the you know combined peak which we call GLX peak that means it is containing both the concentration of glutamate and glutamine then there's a lactate which is I already talked to you which is at 1.3 ppm and uh, it is a characteristic doublet that is applied at T30 and 288 millisecond but inverted at T144 milliseconds. This is not present in normal brain except in neonates and when the child is born, he has some lactate, but with the age, aging process, this lactate vanishes from these uh, cells. It's a product of anaerobic uh, metabolism and it is elevated in ischemia, infarction, and tumors and in various uh, other conditions. Then these are the, you know, uh, then there are lipid peaks. Uh, which added from 0.9 ppm to 1.3 ppm, and uh, they are also they also plays very important role in disease diagnosis. They are usually increase in wide range of destructive cellular processes, necrosis, inflammation, malignancy, and uh, macrophages have often high lipid concentrations. You can make, and then there are macromolecules which also can be you know visualized using in vivo spectroscopy. And these are the peaks which are not usually seen in vivo conditions, but you know, if you make special effort, you know, you make more number of averages and you know keep working in different conditions, then you may also see these peaks in vivo conditions, but usually they are not visualized in uh, in vivo conditions. So there are so many other other you know metabolites which are seen in in vitro uh, NMR, but not in in vivo NMR. So now, how do we uh, specially localize the uh, areas? This is uh, done. Uh, I will talk about uh, you know some of the you know single voxel uh, spectroscopy. You know we you, you apply a slice lifting gradient when you do imaging. So you what you are doing here? You are applying a three slice selection gradients in all the three orientations, and then you the the cross section you know the intersection. Of these three slices will produce a voxel. You can see this is the one slice slicing gradient, other slice slicing gradient, and the third slicing gradient. And the intersection of all the three slices will produce a voxel three-dimensional square or the cube, which is a voxel. 
and which can be moved over this image anywhere and depending on the region where you want to make uh, the spectrum you can create and then you have you know different pulse sequences uh, whether if you are talking about press which is like spin echo in imaging your 90 180 180 you know along with these three uh, uh, gradients uh, slicing gradients you apply 90 degree pulse with another you apply 180 and 180 so you generate an echo using this this is called spin echo signal and uh, this sequence is called press in spectroscopy then you have stimulated echo equation which is called steam which again you apply three gradients but you apply all the three 90 degree pulses in all the three orthogonal directions so these are the different techniques which which are helpful in generating a voxel and then this voxel can be moved around on the image to produce the spectrum so this is a single voxel image and you know this is usually uh, if we call it hunter's angle you know in a healthy brain if you look at the metabolites you should see peaks like this you know this at this 45 degree angle from the from the x axis so that means your spectra is of you no know, acceptable quality you can see this a uh, minus 12 is the lowest peak then choline then creatine then na so this line is more or less at 45 degrees from the x uh, x axis So this is the normal sequence how you do a press you apply a 90 degree pulse and a slice selection gradient in one orientation then another slice selection gradient in y orientation then 180 degree pulse and then z direction also slice selection gradient and a 180 degree pulse so you acquire an echo this is what you call you know press 90 100 80 180 degrees the you know uh, rf pulses and in steam you have steam is like this you have 90 90 90 along with three slicing gradients and uh, here also you are doing like you do you know uh, you know the free focusing in uh, of the echo in gradient echo it's like a gradient echo sequence you can see here is a reversal of gradient to do the you know uh, you don't have a one degree pass over here so you are doing echo uh, you know refocusing by gradient reversal so this is exactly like a you know gradient echo sequence uh, in imaging. So you, these are the sequences where you can have very short echo times for you know low T2 metabolites. This is a surface coil, uh, and if you want to do a superficial you know structures where there is no depth information required like a muscle, you can use simple loop coils, a co coil like this, and then you can acquire the signal from the surface of the you know. This kind of surface coils are usually used for you know the muscle or you know superficial organs. For deeper, deep seated organs, you have to use the steam or the press sequences. So, so now this is you know the uh, you can see uh, the SVS using uh, press. This is a press sequence where you can't have short echo times. So you see only few metabolites when you use a short echo time steam. So you can see, uh, you know, a lot of metabolites are seen in this sequence. So then, like you had, you know, effect of different parameters on the spectra. Here also, you have effect of deep repetition time, number of signal averages, echo time, voxel size, and you know, if you use a longer TR times, your signal will be better. I will not go into details now because you already know from the imaging. If you improve the TR, you are going to get better signal because you are giving enough time for magnetization to return to z axis the number of signal averages it the, it always improves the signal to noise ratio but it increases the measurement time then echo time if you are using a shorter echo times your signal is stronger you can detect more metabolites if you have a larger voxel size then you have more you know, nuclei which participate in the nmr experiment so you have better signal but if you have smaller voxel size you will have a more noisy signal but you know you have to you know see what is the pathology how big is the lesion accordingly you will select your voxel size to get a optimum spectrum you can see this is a tr of 1500 milliseconds so you can see these peaks here and this is a tr of 5000 milliseconds tr has been increased you can see how big peaks are now visualized here so how the signal to noise ratio has improved by changing the tr 
This is the echo time 30 milliseconds, 144 milliseconds, 280 milliseconds. You can see at 30 milliseconds, the peaks are quite high and noise is very low. As you go higher, higher and higher, you know, echo times, this signal will become more noisy. Okay, you can see how uh, the effect of T is there on the spectrum. So this is, you know, uh, when you have number of averages eight, you can see signal is so noisy. But even when, when you increase the number of acquisitions, averages, you can see signal is becoming less noisy and SNR is improving, you know, considerably in this spectrum. So you have to you optimize your, you know, parameters before you acquire. You now this is signal volume of the voxel, you know. If this is a one cc voxel, you can see these peaks are seen like this. If you improve, the, you make a two cc or one by one by two centimeter cube voxel, you can see peaks are much higher and signal to noise ratio is better. So these are the effect of various parameters on the spectrum. So you can also, you know, make a you know, larger voxel and then sub, you know, this is called multi voxel spectroscopy or chemical shift splitting where you have you know bigger area and then you divide them into smaller smaller portions this is very handy when you have you know big tumors which are very heterogeneous and you want to look at interior of the tumors you know what is happening in, in different parts of tumor the whether there's a necrosis or you know uh, tumor recurrence is there so you can look at small small you know voxels and look at the metabolic profiles in different regions in, the, in this tumor so this is again shown shown showing like this and these are then you can generate you know metabolite maps and you can generate the you know concentration uh, images of these metabolites we call it you know this is like truly like molecular imaging where you have a molecule and you are creating an image for that molecule this is na uh, molecule this is na of a poly you can see na is in this region since blue is a low concentration of na so this is the region where the na you know the neurons are compromised there there's a damage in the neurons and that's why you see these you know blue regions from this uh, spectrum here also you can see you know blue areas and you can see the, there's a this, this this red portion this high na region that means here the na is intact so you can look at you know different you know spectrums small small regions in the tumor and find out whether the neurons are intact or neurons are damaged. So here you can see this at normal side and the tumor side. You can see how you know these uh, metabolic profiles NA in tumor is going down. This is from the normal side. You can see NA is high compared to the other side. So you can immediately make you know color coded you know maps of the you know NA and other uh, metabolites. So this is, you know, there are, you know, this is a citrate versus choline. You no, know, this is a citrate, you know, metabolite whose metabolic imaging has been reconstructed from the, uh, from the spectrum data. So you can see how well, you know, how high this citrate is in these regions. This is, this is a, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a tumor, a special type of tumor, where you see high citrate values. So I will show you some of the, you know, uh, spectrum in a disease conditions. This is a normal uh, spectrum from the brain. You can see there's a high NA. Choline is, choline creatine are there, MNS2 is there. You can see how these peaks are looking like. But when you look at disease model, you can see this is a GBM. This is a very, very virulent tumor. You can see the NA at 2 ppm. It's completely gone. There's no viable neurons in this area, in this in this tumor. So it is a very virulent tumor, and this is very very dangerous tumor. It doesn't allow patient to live more than six months after it, he has been diagnosed with a GBM. And you can see there's a only peak is choline. Choline is very high, because which is shown here. And there could be also a lactate here. You can see here. And this is a metastatic lesion. You can see a lactate peak over here. One point. 3 p around 1.3 ppm so uh, 
then this is a uh, lymphomas you can see lymphomas have this again no na the, there are no viable neurons the, this region the all the neurons have died because of the tumor you can see a very high choline peak in this region in the region of this tumor so you can immediately make out uh, what type of tumor it is you know and whether the, there are any viable neurons or the areas already that neurons are already dead in that region so these are the, the these are the grading of tumors you can do using nmr spectroscopy this is a grade 2 tumor grade 3 tumor and grade 4 tumor you can see the in the grade 2 tumor which is uh, in the initial stage you can see there are naa peak is quite visible in grade 2 but when you go to grade 3 and grade 4 grade 3 also you see little bit of peak for grade 4 tumor and at the same time you see choline is much higher than the na and other peaks you can see high choline in grade 4 tumor so this is a very virulent tumor could could lead to go to you know gbm uh, stage see meningioma is very easy to diagnose you will see no other peak in meningiomas but the choline peak and choline creatinine ratio is almost 5 to 6 you, know, you can immediately make out sometime what happens in imaging you know when you have tumors you can't distinguish what type of tumor it is it is better to do select that region of the tumor and do spectroscopy and then by spectral profile you can make out whether there is a what type of tumor is there you can do the grading of tumors and also classification of tumors using mr spectroscopy so this is a typical character of meningioma here this is radiation necrosis you know when there is radiation because you can see a, you see nothing in the spectrum except some peak around 1.5 pm maybe a lactate peak here very big lactate peak so this is a radiation necrosis again you can see a big lactate here in this thing so this is a normal region this is a abnormal region you can see a normal region here which is showing a normal spectrum but from the tumor area you can see the spectrum is entirely different from the normal uh, area this is a tubercular brain you can see uh, the high choline and na there's some sort of you know na peak is there but it is reduced and at the same time you see a lipid high lipid peak so you can see a characteristics of the brain tubercular brain tv and this is tubercular abscess so you can see the high lipids and you know a lactate peak over here this is a uh, hygienic abscess you can see is like here you see the succinate peak very high succinate peak which is not usually visible in uh, uh, other areas but in pyogenic abscess you can see so you can immediately detect that this is a pyogenic abscess and then the doctor can treat the patient accordingly and then you have lipid and you no know, uh, and then you have a big acetate peak nothing nothing around na and all that is gone because na and acetate are very close peaks so na is gone but there's a huge acetate peak in this region this is a i told you of a caravan disease this is the only disease where you see only any high na in this there's no other much peaks are there and this is a genetic disorder that damages the ability of neurons in the brain to send and receive messages that means neural communication is off because of this reason and this this, uh, this disease falls in group of genetic disorders called leukodystrophies and has no cure and this runs in the family sometimes so a very dangerous disease and this is a very typical spectrum if you see a spectrum like this only na peak it you, you are sure that is a cannabis uh, disease And this is a aging uh, brain. I think uh, I will not go into this. You can see with aging, the you know the uh, glutathione peak is you know uh, reduced in aging because of the oxidative stress. And then that is why we always you know recommend when you age, you should take some you know uh, do something which can improve your you know you know antioxidation antioxidants. You must take regular antioxidants. To reduce your oxidative stress and in brain glutathione is the uh, agent which is this is antioxidant agent in brain and it is generated in liver so you must have antioxidants on regular intervals when you when the person ages 
this is a uh, okay this let us forget this is a muscle spectrum because you fat and water from the muscle and this can also give you a lot of you know information about the mu muscle myopathies and other muscle disorders this is a uh, mrs spectrum from the breast you can you know uh, detect the cancer in the breast and this is a uh, normal breast where there's no choline peak so only lipid because breast is a basically a fatty tissue so you can see a big, big lipid peak and then uh, but there's no choline peak in the healthy breast healthy region but if you take a you know disease cancerous breast you do a mr spectrum you can see a big choline peak appearing here so this is choline is a marker of active tumors in uh, as when the uh, when you are doing a spectroscopy of the breast so it is a sort of a tumor which is shown similar way, you know, these uh, prostate cancer is a very common cancer in uh, males. And you can see in the normal, uh, normal uh, prostate, you have a very huge peak of citrate. You know? And there's a very small peak of choline. But if you have, you know, the, the, if there's a, you know, uh, the cancer, you know, uh, prostate cancer, you can see a citrate is almost vanished, but there's a very high choline. So you can immediately make out there whether the, 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 you know, this tumor is benign or cancerous in prostate. This is a very direct, you know, application of MR, application, MRS in, in, in detection of prostate cancer and breast cancer. So this is, once again, shown in the, you know, this is a chemical shift imaging. And within the prostate, you can see which are the regions, you know, which have, you know, cancerous tissue. So that, you know, in case the surgery is performed either this part of the, you know, portion of the, you know, the prostate or the whole prostate can be removed uh, during surgery to uh, to see whether the, once you ensure that the, there's a cancer in the uh, prostate. If there's a benign uh, tumor, then you can let it be there and, you know, let, uh, uh, or you know, depending on individual choice, one can also get it you know resected by surgery. So this is I uh, this is some advanced uh, spectroscopy in you know glutamate and glutamine measurement using mega press is a very specialized technique where you can look at the glutamate and glutamine and minus at all. You know, separately you can look at these peaks by doing spectral editing. Which is a very complex, you know, uh, method. So I think uh, we will uh, stop here. So we will. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, fine. It's fine. So just giving us to the participants. Participants, any any question at at this stage? I will send you some more material for participants. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, then uh, some, also, yeah, some class note uh, or maybe uh, uh, this PDF file of your uh, uh, notes, if possible, you can send. Okay, I will do that. I will send so, some basic basic papers on uh, spectroscopy. You know. Okay, okay fine. Some maybe so that right. the students can go through it. Yeah, actually, there's plenty of material on uh, web, but I will send you some papers. Some basic please. papers which are really easy to understand. Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, fine. I think no question as such. Okay, sir. I think uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You can uh, even close it. So we we'll meet you again on Monday. Okay. Monday, Monday extended class. What do you feel? Sorry. Monday also will have a, an extended class or normal class? No, I, I, I think we'll have normal time. Normal class on the okay. Okay, sir, will... okay, fine. Okay, then I think no question. So if you like, you can close it now. Monday, it can be just 10 minutes extra that I think we should be able to. Uh, okay, fine. 10, 10, 15 minutes uh, extra you can take it as you, as you go along with it. Right now. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.